Greetings. This is Jay Michaels. I'm a professor of media communications and culture, and I have been clocking science fiction, horror, and fantasy for over 50 years. And I'm thrilled to bring you some fantastic television here on the Boston Sci-Fi Channel. Uh, this year, uh, Boston Sci-Fi 48, that's 48 years of the Boston Sci-Fi Film Festival, is bringing us once again a fantastical array of filmmakers with visionary features and shorts that are going to make us not only scream and yell and gasp, but also make us go, hmm, and make us think. And we have a group of them with us today, and I'm thrilled to be able to chat with them. I'm here with my co-host, Jen Bush. Jen Bush is a writer about town. She has she has written uh, uh, for Boston Sci-Fi. As a matter of fact, she, when you when you read up on it, if you're fascinated by these movies, it's she the one that wrote the blurbs. Jen, how are you? I am doing very well, thank you. And yes, I did write those blurbs or edited them. And I could tell you, I am extremely excited about these films. They are fascinating, interesting, innovative, and I can't wait to see them. There were moments where I'd get an email from Jen somewhere that would just say, hey, look at this film. This is cool. So, so Jen is one of those, those, those rare people who believes their own hype and read it and said, oh, I got to see this film. So, mm -hmm. so I'm, I'm thrilled that she could be with us today to, to hear more and more and more about it. Um, let's go right into it. And we're going to start with a, a fellow academic. Um, this gentleman I've spoken to many times, he is, uh, he is, he is uh, as much a part of Boston sci-fi as sci-fi is. And his work is always innovative. It's always brilliant. And he is always the epitome of eloquence. So, so let's start with the wizard, Professor Bob White. Professor White, good to see you as it always is. I look forward to meeting you in the flesh this year. Tell us about your movie. Tell us about you. Flesh is good. My goodness. How did one follow an introduction like that? Well, thank you, Jay. Oh, space women battle giant robots to save the world. That's the theme of my movie entitled Moon Age Daydream, not to be confused with David Bowie's uh, recent Rest His Soul um, slideshow that you can watch for two hours with sunglasses on. So it's, it's listed as Bob White's Moon Age Daydream. Oh, fascinating. I'm sure you're going to be fascinated by this. It's 40 years old, the film, with special dispensation from the uh, from Garen Daly and the festival. I have uh, the privilege of showing a movie I made um, 40 years ago when I was a student at the School of the Museum of Fine Arts. Of course, 40 years ago, I was in my 30s. So what was I doing at school? In any event, I was making uh, studying animation for the first time, and I made a movie. And back then, we shot on 16 millimeter film and sent it to the lab and put it together that way. And I made about five of those movies, uh, shorts, shorts. And then I decided to combine what I knew about video production and animation, and I cobbled together this delightful experience. Um, but looking back, I kind of see it as a, a intentionally poorly drawn comic book built with Frankenstein elements of cutouts and uh, video feedback and a line drawing. So it's a, a, it's a little story. As I said, it's space women uh, battling giant robots to save the world. Uh, oh, let me point, that's space women over here. Giant robots over there. I in the center. Um, back then, festivals only accepted 16 millimeter films, so I had my video transferred to for film, sent it out to festivals, and was very, very uh, fortunate the film received awards in Portugal, in Salerno, Italy, um, Hong Kong, Tokyo, and the Boston New England Animation Festival back then. So that's my tip of the hat. Go. <laughs> I think that's wonderful. Now I have the big question for you. Um, and, and I remember last year we had a challenge. You, you told me about your film and you said, Jay, can you find a parable somewhere in this? <laughs> and I did. 
So now you're making life easier for me, but let's see if you answer such a question. 40 years ago, you made this movie. Why are you bringing it back now? Well, it's the 39th and a half festival season, you know? Um, and I was feeling quite nostalgic. Uh, as fate would have it, back in 1984, 83, 84, I actually sent a print unsolicited to the marathon and never heard back of course it was it was not a time when one it was like throwing a manuscript over the top of the uh, the the door and uh, so I when I was time to um consider what I might enter this this year I said I'm going to take a shot at entering the film that I tried to get in 40 years ago into the marathon and lo and behold as fate would have it, it has been accepted into the festival. Of course it is. Why is it accepted? Let's, uh, let's, space women versus giant robots? To save the world. To save the world. Um, uh, how interesting space women, uh, uh, we're entering the age of Aquarius. Uh, we're, we're looking at a, at a time now where equality is, is precarious uh, mm. and more hard won. And so it really seems like your film is clairvoyant. I'm, I'm writing a book called Hidden Monsters, and it's about the, the parables within uh, the most obscure horror movies. And uh, yours seems to have that because, okay, it's space women versus these giant robots. Could it be the dawning of the age of Aquarius? Could it, it be the, the, the dawning of the age of Aquarius? There you go. And everybody all together now. Um, but... <laughs> It seems you're you're handing us this parable of the change in paradigm. You're handing us the parable of of the change of the world around us. And in, in our previous panel, Jen can attest. Uh, the main thing we talked about: okay, we we stepped out of we stepped out into a new world after the pandemic. What's that new world? You're sort of handing us that, Bob. You have always been clairvoyant, and it is an absolute pleasure to see that you're you're still doing it, and and can't wait for your movie, and can't wait to 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 meet you in the flesh this year because i've been virtual up until now can't wait can't <laughs> thank wait. you thank you my pleasure can, can i just say oh sorry oh, please go ahead jen I, I just need to say that i thought i had a very interesting blazer uh today but there <laughs> i can't compete i love your blazer professor white i i might need one like that <laughs> I give buttons at the festival as well. You can see Moon Age Daydream buttons in me. Blazer, thank you, and God bless you. Well, now I see what I have to pack in my suitcase for, uh, for, for this event. Carolina, tell us about your movie. Tell us, tell us how you are going to startle us this year. Yeah, yeah. So my film, so I'm from Mexico. So my film is uh, made in Mexico and uh, with Mexican actors in Spanish and everything. And, uh, and it's about a love story about uh, a girl who is stuck at her uh, boyfriend's house when there's a storm. And, but she forgot her magic potion that, because she's actually an alien. So uh, that magic potion allowed her to <laughs> transform into a human. Uh, so when she, forg uh, she doesn't have enough potion, she has to uh, reveal to her boyfriend that she's actually an alien. And that's how, uh, so it's about accepting ourselves and coming forward, we're a couple. No? And it's a very simple story, uh, low budget. We did it very uh, with friends and uh, family, like my sister was DP as well. So very homemade, <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, so yeah, <laughs> that's the story. That's wonderful, that's wonderful. And, and you, you, you beat me to it. Yes, we're, <laughs> we're in this avatar world where between cleansers and Photoshop, we are anything but what we actually are. And, and you're giving us the fantastical version of that. And I think that's, that's really brilliant. Um, I look forward to your film. I look forward to, to, to learning more. That's, that's been a message of mine. I'm, as much as I live on social media, as much as I can do the, there you go. And my phone just naturally is magnetized <laughs> in my hand. Uh, uh, I, I rail against the, the addictive qualities of it. And and you're showing us again how, how we are these avatars. Uh, uh, it, it's, it's similar also to the Martian Chronicles, Ray Bradbury's Martian Chronicles, because there was the notion of a shape-shifting alien in that. Uh, and there's the, the subplot of uh, the family whose son passes away and, and a, a Martian steps in and looks like their son. So you're, you're, you're hitting an old method 
but but a new one at the same time. Wow, really well done. And it's a family <laughs> affair. Good, <Yes. laughs> good, 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 good. Uh, there's nothing better than three o'clock in the morning being able to call your fellow filmmaker because, well, it's your sister and she's... she's yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, excellent, excellent. Good luck to you. I look forward to your film. Thank you. Gee, Adam, I don't know what film you're doing, uh, yeah. what awards it may have won. Uh, uh, please tell us all about, let me guess, the warm yeah. season? That's it, man. Yeah, I have to admit, this is my first time ever using a background, so... I'm kind of weirded out by it, but uh, you got to plug your stuff. Uh, but yeah, so um, I'll just kind of walk you through it, if you don't mind. Uh, it's uh, called The Warm Season, and uh, it, it's a desert movie. Uh, it's kind of, I would say it's like a serial comic, which is what, um, as I'm, I'm a writer, I'm a playwright, screenwriter now, I guess. So I tend to do kind of serious, dramatic things that kind of, exist in a skewed reality. And I would say this is definitely that. Um, it, it takes place at a in the desert in New Mexico where it was actually shot, but it the story's in New Mexico and it's this woman who's uh, in her thirties, who's running her family's uh, motel and it's definitely seen better days. It's like a roadside spot. And she's there with her uh, husband who is a semi-successful up-and-coming painter. And she's a photographer who is definitely having trouble in her career, but she won't admit it. You know, every, everything's fine and the motel's fine, but clearly it's not. And, you know, they're living out there with her mom who is aging and seeing better days. And one day she's fixing up the motel and she gets a surprise visit from someone who happens to be uh, extraterrestrial that she met as a little girl and uh in this encounter uh with as a little girl this extraterrestrial looked like a, a mexican man and he approached her with a glowing rock and told her about why he was you know on earth he's there you know looking for another planet for his people to live because their planet is getting very hot and you know there's a joke well it's getting hot here too and he's like yes but my planet's very hot so anyways, uh, you know, in the initial encounter, he hands her this glowing rock and is like, this is how I get home. It's very powerful. Please hold on to it for me and I'll be back to get it soon. So he gives it to her as government agents, men in black are arriving at the site. And uh, he uh, walks to the agents and goes away with them. The little girl hides. And the whole thing is that you know, he said, I'll be back soon, but um, it's 25 years later when the movie takes place. And, you know, she's she's grown up and um, that's the thing. And so it, it's sort of a story of this woman, uh, you know, not necessarily willing to face the reality of her life and how she saw herself living. Um, you know, it's it deals with uh, issues with her relationship with her husband. Um, of, you know, how she perceives her career versus his career, the art he's making versus the art she wants to make. And then ultimately, it's about this uh, extraterrestrial coming back and wanting this rock that he gave her when she was a little girl. And the catch is that um, long ago, she buried it in the desert uh, for reasons that we'll see in the film. And she, at some point in time, went out to check on it, and it, it was gone. So now she's got this dilemma that she needs to get this rock back to the alien, and it's uh, no longer there. So you're you're making a, a very powerful message, yes, about uh, about regret, uh, about yep. life's regrets, uh, and you know the the memories that we bury. Uh, uh, there's a parable just in that the memories that we bury. And mm -hmm. what happens yeah. when they're gone? Uh, why why are we continuing them? Wow. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's interesting because it is funny, but I, you know, I think there also is sadness in it because you know, I think there's a lot of uh, parallels that hopefully audiences will see where it's like, you know, what, you know, how do we let time slip through our fingers? You know, that's kind of like a, a theme in the the story of the different ways every character has sort of let time slip through their fingers. Now time is different for the extraterrestrial whose name man versus the humans, 
but um, you know, it's sort of like, how do we let it slip through our fingers? And then how do we like grab what's left and make the most of it? You're also making a very spiritual sort of message in there yeah. because yeah. here is, here is this being from another world who is bringing us something glowing and wonderful. And, and we, we keep it always and, eventually it does get buried within us and that could be good or bad. And yeah. It's gone. So you're making yeah. a statement about, about a new paradigm with religion as well, with spirituality. Yeah. Um, I've, uh, I cited my last panel that uh, Jen and I did, I cited the twilight zone because the, the reason that Rod Serling wrote the twilight zone was because the censors were killing him on his reality pieces. When he did judgment at Nuremberg and uh, Requiem for a heavyweight, they were cutting out words right and left and it was driving him crazy. And he thought, well, maybe if it's not, instead of it being people, let's make it robots and ghosts and maybe they'll leave me alone. And they did. And the <laughs> Twilight Zone gave us multiple seasons of parables of everything from racism to religion. And everybody left him alone because nobody cared that it was what a, what a robot was seeing. So mm. I see so many things in there that the yep. Spencers may say, oh, that's fine because it's a rock and it's from another world. Mm -hmm. wink wink yeah. good work looking forward to that looking forward to it yeah thanks man john john you're the you're the only one with the solid the solid generic background so we, that's right and yeah that's freshly that. painted walls here there you go the 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 amorphic surrounding um uh, i'm sure your 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 film is 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 that much more colorful <laughs> yeah tell yeah us all about your movie so um, I co-wrote and co-directed this with Zach Wigman. He's on the call here. Um, if you want to raise your hand, Zach. Um, our film, The Courier, as the title suggests, is a, a thriller about just that. Our main character is a motorcycle courier who is stuck in a dead-end job and searching for direction with his life. And our story follows him throughout his workday, where he comes to meet a mysterious woman who invites him into her home to explain the importance of what she needs him to deliver. And without giving too much away, um, over the course of their conversation with each other, it becomes clear that this particular delivery has otherworldly consequences. And um, the story is touching on themes of purpose and family and belonging. And Zach, if there's anything you wanted to add. Oh. Can't, can't hear you. All right. Yeah. Uh, I think the searching for a purpose uh, kind of, yeah, comes out as the, the main theme in here. And I don't think we set out for it to have as much of like a parable or a, like a theme behind it like that, but it sort of uh, ends up feeling like uh, it's, it becomes about the things that we have to sacrifice sometimes unknowingly to uh, achieve the things that we want in life or to find our meaning and purpose for ourselves. So that, that actually comes through. I think we found that through making it, that that was kind of what we are saying through this film. Cool. Jen, I, I, I saw as they were talking, you, you, you said you leaned in, you nodded and all of this. What do you think? What's, uh, what, what sparks in you of this film, which is really fascinating. What, uh, what sparks in you? I'm, I want to know what is. Um, I just, I love the idea that there's this, strange mysterious package and i i think that this courier is going to have a much better experience after he is involved in this package rather than it's probably going to be dangerous but um i think things will turn out better for him that's that's my guess am i right <laughs> <laughs> i don't think he gets what sorry i don't think they can tell us or can they uh, I have to see the screen of it. <laughs> yeah, it's up for discussion. <laughs> Jury's out. I'm 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 thrilled to hear that because uh, something like this, when you hear, uh, I'm bringing something to you, as we have with the with the glowing rock in in the warm season. It's like, what does what does this bring us? And and I really like that. That's it. It, it draws your audience in, and it's already giving Jen an opinion. Let's see how right she is when when we all see the movie. Josh. Uh, read much? Uh, oh, this is, I'm in my office. This is my office conference room. So not all mine, but. Oh, okay. Yeah. Tell uh, us about actually, your film, you literate person, you tell us. <laughs> tell us about um, your work. So my film is called Amanda Forever and Always. 
Um, I actually wrote it back in 2019. One of the biggest struggles I have in creating a short is explaining it without ruining it. And I'm assuming no one here has seen it, but I'll, I'll give it a shot. Um, the process was back in 2019, I was awake at three in the morning and I had this idea kind of similar to what Adam was talking about, about time um, and ex how you experience time. And then that led into parallel universes, you know, the normal thoughts one has at three in the morning. Um, and then as a writer, I was wondering how to, how can I put this into a story? It's too grandiose, um, thinking about budgets. So my goal became, how do I take what would normally be this incredibly grand story and tell it the smallest way possible? So that's what I did. I took this story about parallel universes, turned it into a, essentially a rom-com, put it in one location of two people having dinner over baked CD, and uh, now I have a movie. Hmm. Okay, you sparked in me something here. Parallel universe. Now, any of us who's ever read a comic book since 19, since, since science wonder stories of the 20s uh, know about parallel universes. But, but lately, it's, it's, it's becoming, de rigueur, it's becoming a fashion statement. Okay, Marvel movies talk about the multiverse. Yeah, got it. Okay, Doctor Strange and Spider-Man are going into a multiverse, and they've hired three actors to play Spider-Man. Got it. But, but now we're hearing an Academy Award nominee is about a multiverse. Uh, and we're getting the notion of the parallel universe. And it's interesting because it's coinciding. This year at uh, uh, Boston Sci-Fi's Film Festival, we're celebrating 60 years of Doctor Who. And for, for the two of you that don't know who Doctor Who is, uh, it's, it's the ultimate British series about, uh, about a time traveler. And so you get the parallel universe feeling again. Um, uh, Josh, I'll ask you, uh, why? Why parallel universe? What, what is in our consciousness now that tells us, you know, okay, what happens if? What, what, what's there? Well, for me, um... My, my short film does have many parallels with um, everything everywhere all at once, but I will say I, I shot it two years prior, but just didn't finish it until recently. <laughs> um, for me, it's the idea of possibilities um, that they're with the idea of infinite universes, everything is possible out there. Essentially that's, that's so, so any, any problem you're having, in this universe, any wish you have in this universe, you can tell yourself with infinite universes, it exists somewhere out there. Hmm. Jen, you're a fellow comic book geek like I am, so I can, I can ask you the same question. Uh, uh, what, what's going on? Why, why do we all want to go through the time warp? What's, uh, why, why do you think we have parallel universes, so many multiverse stories on so many levels now? Because you could be a more interesting person in other multiverses, or you could meet more interesting people in multiverses, and you can do the impossible in multiverses. Maybe I can fly in a multiverse. You can. <laughs> Josh knows. He's, he's, he's been there. Um, I'd love to fly because the bus takes so long and the trains never... I'm not going to go into it. I won't complain. Um, I'm just going to go into Brian. Brian, your name is familiar. This is not your first film. This is not your first rodeo, is it? No, it's not. <laughs> I, thought so. I thought your name was familiar to me. Please tell me about your movie. Yeah, so my name is Brian Quintero, writer, director in Toronto, Canada, but my background's Costa Rican. So I come from, you know, uh, first generation Costa Rican uh, family. And uh, yeah, mine's a, it's a horror comedy called Old Timers. And the sort of idea was sparked with a sort of a mentor of mine because my background's in acting and a mentor of mine who I've remained friends for a long time. We were having coffee one day and we were just talking about artistry. We're talking about how he's an older gentleman. So he felt that, you know, something that he could give back one day is, is that support to the new wave of that generation that new wave of filmmakers and I found that so inspirational I was like oh that's really interesting so I started thinking about well what about these two guys who are just talking about their legacy and 
their artistry. So I came up with this idea, old timers, where that in Christmas, <laughs> so it's a seasonal horror comedy about these two associates who come together during the holiday seasons to hash out their differences, to to get to know each other's work and talk about that same legacy. But their hope is to give this ultimate gift for one another. And that gift is a new disturbing collaboration, this new disturbing legacy that they're going to do together without spoiling it. So, so it's interesting to hear everyone talk about time because it does have to do with time. It has to do whether you're good or truly evil, I won't say which, but <laughs> uh, basically it does uphold your, your legacy as to who you become. And I thought, um, you know, between how famous or, in, in, you know, the infamy behind that legacy that you live behind is essential. You, there's one thing you can't escape, which is, which is age. And so that's what they talk about. And yeah. Wow. Okay. So, so you have your, that is a horror movie talking about <laughs> right on. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Bob. I was trying to figure a clever way of talking about age and you did it for me. Well <laughs> done. Um, and I like the new disturbing legacy part of it. I know mm. you're sort of dangling the, 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 the plot line to us mm. and I like that. It's it's easy to, it's easy to be Christmas Carol and say okay I'm just going to be really wonderful now in life. It's another thing to say okay well you know what I'm an sob. Let's. <laughs> I I like that I like that. I, I think it helps because like I think once once you watch the movie it becomes this even bigger conversation about who they really are and how that that affects our society. So you 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 also bring up a point which I'm noticing in genre films horror science fiction fantasy the whole works. It's no longer, you don't need a Luke Skywalker just because you have a Darth Vader. You know, now, now it's like, okay, let's have an anti-hero. Okay, they're, they're doing what they need to do. Doesn't mean it's right. Doesn't mean that they're, it's legal, but they simply have to do it. We have far more Han Solos than we have Luke Skywalkers these days. And, and I'm really impressed at that. And I'm thrilled that you're, you're doing something about age. That's, and I'm, I'm not, I'm not, uh, I'm not spotlighting myself or anything like that, but I'm just saying we need to look at all, we look at all genres. We need to look at all individuals. And I think mm -hmm. science fiction is one of the few that, that have always embraced it. Really interesting. Really interesting. You sparked many thoughts uh, with your piece. And also Wink, congratulations on making it a Christmas movie. That's how it's replayed every year. If, yes. <laughs> if, if Christmas Carol was called Tuesday, nobody would care. But I okay. think it helps with the misdirection too. So, uh, yes, you're making a standing comment <laughs> about commercialism within a spiritual realm. So, uh, so I, 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 I doff my cap to you again. Well done. Well done. Okay. Uh, now we have a mysterious visitor from another planet or maybe a multiverse. We have iPhone uh, appearing uh, on my screen. Well, <laughs> yeah, iPhone, my how are you? Working. Sorry oh. about that. That's okay. Uh, that's okay. I'm tell us, Mr. tell us who you are and your movie. I'm just a guy. I didn't even make a film. I just hacked your Zoom meeting. <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, my name's Andrew Lee Ryan. Uh, I wasn't sure if this was the right uh, section for me to join. I think the email said 12:45. Didn't know which one of the two. Um, my film is Chimera. It's about a um, VR simulation junkie. Uh, lives in a small town, Backwoods, uh, Connecticut. Um, and this VR runs on dopamine cartridges, so it quite literally makes her happy. Uh, and she comes out of the game and she doesn't have any cartridges left, so she has to go on a mission in reality to get a new cartridge before uh, going through happiness withdrawal. Wow. Why? Why'd you make it? You fascinated me. That's why I'm asking. Why, why'd you make oh, yeah. it? Uh, why did I make it? That's a good question. Um, I wrote, directed, and produced it at the height of the pandemic, um, which I wouldn't wish upon my enemy to direct and produce at the same time uh, during the pandemic, but uh, we managed to do it with the help of some very talented artists who were willing to uh, play ball for not as much money as they probably should have been paid. 
Um, but the main what? inspiration. Not getting what you're worth in the arts? That's so rare. It never happens. Yeah. <laughs> um, but so the main inspiration for it was actually Animal Crossing for Nintendo Switch. I don't know if you've played that game before. Um, but at the start of the pandemic, my wife and I got addicted to essentially dissociating from reality and playing a game about chopping wood and picking apples uh, to build an island that didn't exist. Um, and so we, I, I don't know how many hours she logged, more than me, but uh, we would essentially go there and we'd be like, oh yeah, that's right. Our real world is burning, but I have this cute little island <laughs> that I'm maintaining and everything's fine. Um, so I just wanted to tell a story about a woman who uh, actually was addicted to it and needed that in order to uh, dissociate from her world. Yeah. Uh, the, it, it, the parable of that is weighing on top of me so hugely. How many, how many, especially young people, pardon me for, for sounding condescending that way, how many young people got addicted to, to video games, to anything during the pandemic. How many of us watched everything on Netflix, including Cobra Kai and Tiger King, right. just to, to, to kill time? Oh my I gosh. I think something everyone can relate to. I think everyone wants to dissociate from reality somehow, whether you do it through a drug or a video game. Um, it's, very, it's very similar. You're just taking something and saying, I'd rather be doing that. It seems to be a theme amongst uh, most of the films, even being talked about right now, amongst the 10 of us. So everyone's, that's what science fiction provides, right? Sure. It's that alternate reality that we can all go to and escape. And we can, we can share that together, maybe learn something about our current reality that we couldn't talk about prior because it would be too heavy handed. That's an interesting thing that you're saying because um... Uh, and, and I've said this with drug addicts, we hear about uh, people on serious drugs. I'm not talking about the legalized kind that you can, that you can buy anywhere, I've discovered. But uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm talking about the serious kind. You, you get those that, that will raise, however they do it, exorbitant funds to afford their drug habit. And I've always thought, what if they focused that energy on raising money for their lives just to live a, a better life they, they, they'd they'd be millionaires they'd be millionaires if they did that here at, or in general I, I from my perspective and from people i've spoken to it's it's just easier to ignore the suffering instead of sitting in it and like thinking about how you can address that in your life and build <laughs> from that from the lowest possible point you're at it's much easier to just say ask for it and go with the thing that makes you happy in that moment Right, right. Eat, eat the junk food, yeah. not the salad. Exactly. Jen, I know during your uh, your incarceration, uh, <laughs> you you took art classes. You took you you put videos up of you singing. You did you 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 were alive on on uh, on social media. Uh, uh, how does this movie spark within you? Because you uh, you 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 took this virtual life and you made it a, an entire world. How how does it spark with you? Well, very interesting. Um, it really resonated with me because I got an Oculus virtual reality headset during the pandemic. And I fought Darth Vader in there. <laughs> I, <laughs> I did. And um, it really helped. But I could see the technology growing and growing. And somehow I could see your movie becoming a reality. Yeah, I hope not, but well, <laughs> maybe not. That's morning. <laughs> and that was that was a, that was a flawless segue in the big question I wanted to ask all of you, because um, I, I see it in the warm season. I've always seen it in, in Professor White's work. I'm seeing it in all of your movies. Uh, I have an expression that I, I usually ask. Are you a genius accidentally or on purpose? Uh, and and all of your movies are sparking very powerful visceral messages that are happening now. Um, when you made your movie, did you intend on having these underlying parables? Did you intend on having this 
par uh, this this parable about uh, women's rights, about about community, about drug addiction, about all. Of did you have? Did you say I'm making this movie and it takes place here? But the real message is. Or one night at three o'clock in the morning, you just finished it. You were watching the rushes of it, and you just say, oh, "I'm talking all about society's need to." How did that happen? Are you a genius on purpose or by accident, Professor White? Let's start with the genius that you are. What, what do you think? Let me throw you a curve answer. One of my favorite films now, and I would have been my favorite film forty years ago was Peter O'Toole in Venus. And he stars with Jodie Whittaker, who is now exiting as the first woman, Doctor Who. And my favorite quote, for most men, a woman's body is the most beautiful thing they'll ever see. What's the most beautiful thing a girl sees? Do you know? Her first child, genius. Time travel, back to you. <laughs> I told you, enigmatic and brilliant as always. That's a really interesting point. And the fact it's Jodie Whittaker, uh, well done, well done. Carolina, Carolina, are you a genius by accident or on purpose? Uh, so I don't know, it's kind of both. No, I'm joking. But if, for example, the idea, I had, uh, first I had the idea of the film, no? And I always try to think about theme, but uh, sometimes it's hard because I try to say something, but then it doesn't go with my first, the first image I had, uh, like the first image that gave me the idea to make the film. So it's trying to fit both, but then as I was writing the script and as I was uh, doing uh, many drafts, each draft, uh, it was focusing more and more into a message. So then uh, maybe it was on purpose that I was trying to talk about being yourself because it's a team that's always been with me. Uh, so I don't know, it's like, like, I mean, having the idea, but then trying to feed the teams, but it has to be a team that goes with the idea. So I think it's a process. Mm -hmm. I, I, I'm, I'm reminded of, a, of a, a documentary I saw about voiceovers where they said anybody could, could do Bugs Bunny or Fred Flintstone, but could they do Bugs Bunny or Fred Flintstone reading Shakespeare? Uh, and and I think yours yours hits a particular point like that because you're saying okay I had a message but I got to make it work in the movie so so there's a very strong hurdle that you all go through and I commend you on it okay here's my message here's my movie how do I get them together wow that that uh, that, that sounded yeah. like it was quite quite uh, quite the journey for you hmm. interesting very interesting Adam Adam tell me uh, uh, are are you brilliant on purpose, or are you br or you did you trip over brilliance? Oh, I I would say I just tripped and fell on the ground. Um, no, it's um, you know, with like with anything I write, I mean, I don't think I'm I'm setting out to, you know, convey like a, a specific theme or a message. I think I just start with a kernel of an idea, and uh, with this, I mean, the first draft of this script I wrote, maybe 2012. You know, and then I shelved it for like five or six years. Um, the the idea, you know, you just start with this thought. So very simply, it was, you know, there's this woman out in the desert running a rundown motel and she's visited by an alien. And I sort of so it was almost like I, I approached it by setting, setting an atmosphere and then this encounter. And, you know, you start with like a very little snowball. And as the story progressed, you know, the snowball would get bigger and bigger and I would add things into it. Uh, so that was just like the first draft. Uh, then it was really interesting because I developed things like theme and specific message once uh, Janet Grillo, who was the director, when she came on board about a year and a half prior to filming, then, you know, we worked on what do you want the film to say? Uh, what will the ultimate takeaway or takeaways be? And she she's a brilliant uh, writer in her own right, and so yeah, that that was really valuable. Um, maybe that was kind of a long winded answer, but uh, that's uh, yeah, that's kind of how it happened. It, it you you make me think of of you know when someone wants to talk about jokes, they say two guys walked into a bar, uh -huh. and already in our brains we're starting to formulate the future. So you sort of did the same thing. You looked at the desert, and you said, okay, 
what's here? What, what am I feeling? What, 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 what aroma uh, pervades my nostrils? Interesting. Very yeah. interesting. Yeah. Um, we all do this. We all watch, uh, especially if it's a genre film, we all watch these movies. And the start, we look at it and go, oh, okay, okay, this is what's going to happen. And we're almost disappointed if something different happens. So you're, uh, I, I like the notion you started with setting. Gentlemen, John and Zachary, tell me, uh, uh, which one of you is a genius on purpose and which one of you is the genius by accident? Um, I think this was a, a fun experience for the both of us because we, we stumbled through it all together, which was cool because we co-wrote it. And it was also a, a pandemic project of ours. So we were, we were doing our writing um, just like we're doing the Zoom call, Zach and I from our separate quarantines and um it was it was a fun experience because we had never written anything together and we we had a set um and a setting in mind for the story and as we continued on through our drafts um we we stumbled through and and fell into uh themes that that we both wanted to pursue yeah and to that end i think uh talking about falling into it on uh on accident i think what what ended up happening happening more so is that we started we didn't start with a theme or an idea that we wanted to touch on as much as we wanted to focus on a feeling and an emotion so we were focusing on like on tension we wanted these scenes to be a rising sense of tension and dread and paranoia throughout uh, this encounter that some details become slowly released and it becomes more and more uh, tense and and builds until this huge reveal and explosion of of uh, action that uh, we were focused on more so than finding a particular parable to explain. And then uh, I think as we read through the script more and more and revised it, we realized that we were saying something a little more personal uh, for both of us having like moved across the country to a different city together trying to uh, start our careers uh, in separate ways and figuring out that it isn't always what you think it is and um, yeah I think that was kind of what we realized was coming out of us uh, as we were writing this story not even knowing what we uh, were saying. Uh, you you bring up uh, another word that has come into play lately. Trigger. Your uh, we we always hear now even in in playbills that it has to say there's a trigger warning. Uh, uh, I I I get a kick out of it when it in in the corner of a film that you're watching it says nudity, violence, smoking. I'm like wow, even smoking is a trigger warning. But it's interesting. You're saying you're going to you immerse yourself in that trigger. You you want tension. You're going to give yourself the trigger warning and hope it elicits something within us. And, and that's right. Yeah. Wow. Good for you. That's that's adventurous. That's you're you're not playing it safe. And I really appreciate that. Looking forward to your film for for that alone. For that alone, Josh. Josh, uh, brilliant. Why? How? Tell me. Um. I'm not going to say yes, and it's, uh, but um, I would say for my film in particular, my goal was to use misdirect as humor. So you start thinking the story might be one thing, you know, is it a relationship drama? Is it sci-fi? And yes, but, but it ends up really being a love story. Um, and that's, that's what my goal was. And I hope I succeeded with it to get this idea of these people that have infinite possibilities and options and realizing what's actually most important um, by kind of shoving it at all into this kind of banal setting and situation. Um, I hope I succeeded in that. If there's anything beyond that, I don't think that idea is timely. I think that's, that's a story that maybe has been told before and everyone throughout generations can relate to it. Um, if there's anything, else taken from it, then it's purely accidental genius. Okay, I'll take accidental genius. You sound, there's, uh, when, when Matt Smith was the doctor on Doctor Who, there was an episode where, uh, due to, I don't remember at this point, I've watched every episode, the, the mystical aspect, the, the TARDIS, his time machine comes to life and becomes a woman. And so he can actually speak to his TARDIS. And at one point he's arguing 
and he he says, will you never take me where I want to go? And the TARDIS says, I take you where you need to go. And it sounds like you're you're going in that sort of direction. Okay, you're misdirecting us. We think we're here, but what we need to see is this. So you're sort of handing us this lesson. Um, interesting, and you're so humble about it. Stop that. Uh, uh, really interesting. I, I, I look forward to seeing your movie and seeing how it triggers me, what I, <laughs> what I feel about what I feel about it. Um, Brian, Brian, are you a yes. genius? Tell me how and why. I think it, I think it dives into a bit of both. Uh, <laughs> not to, you know, I've been very humble too, but I've worked really hard on this project, so I'm okay accepting that. Too. And I think part of it was just like that conversation, lightning strikes, depending on, you know, who you're talking to or where the idea comes from. So like I mentioned, I had that conversation with him. I think I'm very strong with conceptual ideas, not so much the message. And for example, with old timers, it just came to me like that. It was, I, I didn't even have the script. I pitched it to the producer, Kirk Cooper. And I was, I was just like, well, this is my idea. What do you think? He's like, that's great. You're going to write it. I'm like, and I, mean, I saw it in my head. So I wrote it in like less than four hours, just banged it out. And then from there, I was like, yes, it's there. Now we have the script. What do we do? So for me, I like to take my time. I like to take my time, have these conversations, see who likes the ideas and build that as a process. Because I find that, you know, I feel like the consensus talking to people it's it's like with what i'm trying to do is that vibing with everyone you know and so it actually took it was happening during the pandemic and um it took about a year to go to camera so even though i wrote it so quickly it the revision the the refinement of the project allowed me to just really take my time and understand is this a project i still want to do and until all those components came together and until i discovered for myself, wow, this is actually bigger than just a concept. I believe this is something that hasn't really been talked about. It's something that moves me. It allows me to, and I think that's my acting background. It's the exploration of just allowing it to become and not necessarily holding um, to every attention to detail. So um, like, obviously when you make a film you want to, right? But um, I mean, I mean, so not to be hard on yourself and allow it to be what it becomes. So from there, I was patient and we were able to get some actors who thought the same way. And I waited one for one actor in particular for six months because I said, he is the guy. And then all of a sudden we had, I needed something very specific, a fireplace. I'm like, I'm cool with whatever house, but I have to have a fireplace. So there are moments that you have to fight for what you want and i believe that's part of that process i think so i i, I think i hope i uh, answered your question there <laughs> completely you've also sparked in me the notion of the parable of life itself we, yeah. we as as young people as children even we sit there and say we're gonna i want to be a doctor i want to be a fireman i want to be and then it takes our entire lives to get there and at the end of it maybe we're there or maybe we're something else entirely how many people do we know that that said, oh, yeah, when I was a kid, I want to be a baseball player. What are you now? I'm a nuclear physicist. Okay, well, there's a difference. Uh, so, so you never actually you never actually know. You start, like you said, I've, I've written the script of my life in four hours. Now mm -hmm. it's going to take me the next 80 years to, to accomplish it. And I think that the main answer is instinct. That's the main, that's yep. the main thing. Yep. Trusting your instinct. Yep. We all have that. We all... Uh, I use this in, in communications class. I say, have you ever had a conversation with someone and immediately liked them or immediately disliked them? And it's all its all in that instinct. It's all in that feeling. Uh, well put. Uh, see what you caused? See what you caused, Mr. iPhone. Uh, uh, you can uh, just call me iPhone. Cool. I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. Yeah, you can just call me iPhone. That's cool. iPhone, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. I'll, I'll do exactly that. It's Andrew, just uh, as a reminder. Um, uh, I know that. I should. It's 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 my son's name. I better remember your name. Uh, it's, it's a really common name. I'm actually, I go by Andrew Lee Ryan because there are 33 other Andrew Ryans on IMDb. Mm -hmm. So i got to set myself apart somehow, I guess. Uh, 
I, I realized that having the plastic name of J. Michaels, there's only about 8,000 yeah. just in the arts alone. Um, yeah, it's you, you, you sparked the question in me. So now I'm, I'm, I'm asking you for the answer. Genius on purpose or intentional? You created this piece. Uh, did Was the message in there all along or did it just suddenly appear? Definitely not a genius. Uh, my wife can attest to that. Um, <laughs> in terms of whether or not it, you know, it was something it, like special or anything, I think we're all a product of um, the environment we're exposed to, the information um, that we experience. Uh, so as a storyteller, your job is just to reflect that back at society. Um, so nothing really special about it. I just took what I saw and figured people would resonate with it. Um, this idea that happiness is uh, an illusion, you know, it's fleeting. We chase it. It's gone the second we grab it. Um, I think that's universal. And so I don't think it's necessarily timely. It's just forever. Uh, you, you bring up the point, a, a, a philosophy a major that I knew, a philosophy colleague, uh, he, he'd always say it's, you know, don't worry about being happy, be about, worry about being content. And, and so you, you really hit that with what's happiness? You know, we're all pursuing happiness. What does that mean? And so you're handing us this huge message. Uh, as, as humble as you sound, something tells, I, I have a feeling there's some genius in there within this. So I look forward to, uh, I look forward to seeing yours and I look forward to seeing all of these films. Jen, let's, 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 let's wrap up. And I ask you, um, you, you you're, you've had a life change, if you will. Uh, when I met you, you were a teacher. Uh, and and now kaboom! Here you are in in a totally everybody's frozen. Uh, uh, can I? Can you hear me now? Yes. There yes. You you, Try again. <laughs> either you were frozen for a moment, or you were listening far too intently. Uh, so you, when I met you, you were you were a teacher. When I met you, you had a different life, and now, uh, fantastically speaking, you're in a different world. Um, Thanks to you. <laughs> uh, let's. Uh, what does it, what does it mean? Like, like Andrew's talking about, you know, the, the pursuit of happiness, uh, mm -hmm. and, and we're, we're seeing how the road lays out in front of us. How, how does the road lay, lay for you in this new world? How did the road lay for you? You went from this to this, what happened? Well, even when I was a professional speech therapist, I always, ever since childhood, I had my hand and, and heart in the arts. Um, simultaneously, while doing speech therapy, I was in multiple rock bands. I partnered up with a, with a rock guitarist and we're very happy together. We have a very happy life together. Uh, now that I am fully steeped in the arts, I am a very content, happy, delighted person. I, the arts feed my soul, whether it's singing, acting, sketching, writing, interviewing, it feeds my soul. That's, that's where I'm supposed to be in life. Uh, it, it's interesting. Your, your TARDIS took you to where you were supposed to be, not where you wanted to be. Mm -hmm. uh, I, think, I think we all have that. I think we, we sit down somewhere, wherever we are, and we just say, is this where I want to be? No or yes. And then whether it takes 80 minutes or 80 years, we get to exactly where we want to be. Mm -hmm. uh, Ladies and gentlemen, thank you all so much for being here and telling us about your immensely brilliant films. You are all geniuses, whether or accidentally on purpose, you are all geniuses. And I really look forward to seeing your movies. How many of you are going to be in Boston for the event itself? Excellent. I am going yeah. to be in Boston. Oh, a bunch of you, excellent. Please look for me, please let's chat. Let's, uh, I wanna know more about your movies. I can't wait to see them. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's gonna be a blast. Everyone out there, the Boston Sci-Fi Film Festival, the 48th year, talk about time travel, uh, mm -hmm. is going to be starting February 15 in Boston. Go to bostonsci-fi.com to learn more about how you can get tickets and see these amazing films. And if you can't make it because you're halfway around the world, then what you do, you log on to that same website and you can get to the Boston Sci-Fi Channel, which will be inaugurated at the same time. It will be year round and it will be quality programming, uh, classic films, new works, 
and original content. It's the Boston Sci-Fi Film Festival having its own channel and will keep you in fantastic television for as long as you wish. Thank you all very much. I look forward to seeing you in the future, whether that's Boston or wherever the future may be. <laughs> but I thank you all for this. Yeah. Really a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jay. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Jay. Thanks.